Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon to wherever you're watching this from. The next hour will be dedicated to our online event entitled Modern Governments for Effective Multilateralism, which is the kickoff, so to speak, for this year's annual meeting of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We will be dividing the next hour into three blocks. First, we will hear from the Secretary General of the OECD, Matthias Korman. Then we will have about half an hour for a panel discussion with different stakeholders involved with the AIIB. And last, there will be time for your questions, for audience questions. So if you have any questions, please use the question and answer button on the right-hand corner of this live stream page, and we will hopefully get to them up towards the end of the hour. But first, we are honored to have with us the Secretary General and highest representative of a multilateral organization that's 10 times older than the AIIB. Mr. Coleman has been at the helm of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development as of March last year. Previously, he was Australia's finance minister. Mr. Coleman, we are delighted to have you and we look forward to your remarks. The virtual floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you so much. And it's uh, great uh, to be here. And I should say, uh, as Australia's finance minister, I was part of the decision by the Australian government to join uh, the AIIB uh, some years ago. So thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to join the conversation and, and to say a few words about uh, the importance of multilateralism in today's challenging world. And of course, uh, very much in the context of the Asian uh, infrastructure and investment banks, important mission. Uh, you are uh, an important part of the multilateral architecture as we all seek to ensure uh, sustainable long-term development and enhanced resilience uh, in developing countries. And uh, there remains so much work to be done on this front, and we truly need uh, all hands on deck to help us reach our development objectives. Uh, your annual meeting comes at a time of found challenge and uncertainty in the global economy. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led uh, to lower growth, triggered a wave of inflation, and you know, which is now becoming more and more growth-based. Energy and food prices are up. Households and businesses are faced uh, with rapidly increasing costs, while food security in low-income uh, countries in particular uh, is at risk. And at the same time, uh, measures in response to COVID-19 continue to disrupt uh, supply chains in Asia with global consequences, in particular also for uh, low and middle income countries. We must grapple with these pressures in the short term while uh, laying the groundwork for the sustainable transition of our economies over the long run. And we must do so in a way that supports the growth aspirations of developing economies. This will uh, require a massive amount of investment in growth, resilience, and structural transformation. And the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank has a critical role to play here in helping to mobilize the necessary investment. At the OECD, we estimate that around $6.9 trillion US will be needed each year uh, through to 2030 to meet the Sustainable Development Goals in a way that is compatible with uh, the objectives under the Paris Agreement. Uh, collectively around the world, we're currently falling well short with spending uh, or investment, I should say, at around 3.4 to $4.4 trillion US. Um, it's clear that no single country can make up uh, this investment gap on its own and no single government uh, can uh, tackle all of the related challenges, including the climate change and environmental sustainability a challenge on its own. No single economy can meet the urgent need for critical goods and services created by crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic on its own. So it's self-evident that uh, multilateral cooperation is essential in providing the collective responses required in response to our shared global challenges. Common standards, a core focus of the OECD's work are important to help optimize the effectiveness of multilateral actions. They help ensure a globally better coordinated approach in terms of policy objectives, definitions of key concepts, implementation mechanisms, data collection, and indeed making sure that we optimize implementation. 
They also generate the necessary conversations on areas where countries could and should increase their level of ambition and effort. But let me highlight three areas of relevance uh, to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank where multilateralism and international standards can help us improve outcomes. Uh, first, when it comes to improved donor coordination, it can help address challenges stemming from growing demands on the multilateral development system. Uh, the recent confluence of crises has stretched available resources. Uh, this year, the UN registered a record funding shortfall for humanitarian assistance of $31.4 billion US. At the same time, the multilateral development architecture is more crowded and fragmented uh, than ever. Uh, more donor contributions are earmarked, limiting flexibility and putting pressure on multilateral development organizations to rely on new funding models, including private finance. The OECD can contribute to strengthening the multilateral development system by helping to develop a common set of good multilateral donor practices. Second point is that we must recognize that it's not just the amount of infrastructure investment that is important when it comes to the pursuit of our development goals, but also and even more importantly, the quality of that investment. Uh, common policy frameworks across governments and multilateral development banks, we believe are needed to ensure investment is aligned with our shared objectives, including our shared climate and sustainability objectives. Uh, after all, the infrastructure investment decisions we make today will lock countries, including the bank's beneficiaries, into a long-term trajectory. Uh, we recognize your institution's commitment to aligning your operations uh, with the objectives of the Paris Agreement uh, by July 2023. The 2022 OECD recommendation on the governance of infrastructure also sets out the good practices to ensure value for money, integrity, and sustainability of infrastructure projects, and we commend it to you. We have developed a diagnostic tool, the indicators of the governance of infrastructure to help countries evaluate their progress in implementing uh, this recommendation. That will include an additional eight Asia Pacific countries by next year, in addition to OECD members and 11 Latin American and Caribbean countries. We're also working to promote harmonization across the many international initiatives in this space, such as the G7 a Partnership on Global Infrastructure Investment, the European Union a Global Guideway, and uh, the Blue Dot Network. Uh, third point is that recent uh, crises have demonstrated the need to incorporate resilience explicitly into the work of multilateral institutions, including the work of uh, development banks. Uh, this includes assessing the resilience of our own institutions. Uh, the OECD's Lessons in Multilateral Effectiveness Project uh, has collected studies on the response recent crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can be better prepared for the future. Resilience is also a valuable lens to apply to investment and development finance decisions. The OECD analysis found that approximately one quarter of the world's population is exposed to risks that their government and communities lack the ability to manage, absorb or mitigate. Um, our States of Fragility tool helps map these risks, allowing development institutions to prioritize and optimize their impact. Let me conclude with a word about governance, which I know is an important theme of your discussions today. Uh, strong member oversight and transparency have been priorities of my time, uh, as brief as it has been so far, uh, 16, 17 months. My time as Secretary General of the OECD in leading this organization. Uh, and you know, I believe and we believe this oversight is important for both the management of the organization and the quality of our outputs. But this is an ongoing process, and we continue to uh, identify opportunities to improve. And you know, clearly that is a challenge for all uh, international organizations, all multilateral organizations to continue to focus on. Um, I believe that high governance standards rooted in transparency, accountability, and adherence to member priorities are key to the success of multilateral organizations. There's a great deal counting on this success, including our ability to achieve our long-term development, sustainability, and resilience objectives. 
So as you focus on ways to optimize your contribution as part of our global development architecture, I encourage you to keep these stakes in mind today as you chart the future of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank's own governance framework. Thank you so much again for uh, letting me join uh, this conversation today, and, and I look forward to um, having a conversation with you now. Well, thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you so much for your remarks. That was very interesting and very wide ranging. Um, let me touch on a few points that you've made. First of all, I think you made a very convincing case that the world needs rules-based multilateralism to solve global challenges. And, and you mentioned yourself the COVID crisis, which is the, you know, the epitome of a global challenge. Um, how would you judge the state of this multilateralism looking at the case study of COVID? Uh, well, look, I mean, it, it's, you know, very sadly a statement of the obvious that the rules-based international system is under a severe strain. I mean, that was already the case before COVID, uh, I got to say. I mean, rules-based trading system in particular uh, was under strain, uh, you know, given uh, some of the trade tensions that were playing out in particular between uh, the United States and China. Uh, COVID-19 um, brought its own challenges, you know, in terms of uh, global supply chains, um, and now uh, we have um, a, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, uh, which has the job of uh, preserving uh, and enforcing compliance with our rules-based uh, international order, uh, seeking to shift internationally recognized borders by the use of force in, in direct breach of um, international law. So, I mean, th there's some severe challenges uh, to the international rules-based order, yet um, it is so important for us to uh, keep working uh, to get it into a, a better shape. Um, I mean, there are some uh, good examples in recent times where it has worked. I mean, the OECD through the G20 and uh, working to an inclusive framework with uh, 140 countries and jurisdictions around the world was able to facilitate multilateral agreement on reforming our international tax system to make it fairer and work better in the context of a digitalized, globalized world uh, economy. And, and we're in the process now of seeking to implement that reform. I mean, when you look at the challenge of climate change, I mean, you know, self-evidently, it can only be addressed effectively uh, if countries around the world come together and better coordinate uh, and better align uh, their efforts to ensure it can be genuinely globally uh, effective. I mean, there's a whole range of other areas uh, within which uh, it is clearly important for countries to come together. I mean, I think in that context, the G20 is is an important forum, but but at the moment, uh, you know, right now in the context of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, I mean, a lot of these um, platforms are um, sadly under severe strain and the world would be much better off if um, uh, we had a return to a just uh, peace for Ukraine as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Um, you also mentioned, um, this is a bit of a different uh, strand now, you also mentioned the fragmentation of the multilateral development system. Um, forgive me for asking a bit of a provocative question. I mean, when you look at the AIIB, a fairly new institution, and we talk about fragmentation, is it part of the problem or is it part of the solution? No, well, I, I mean, you know, clearly, I mean, I see it very much part of the solution. I mean, it's a, it was a very substantial initiative uh, by uh, China some um, eight or nine years ago. Um, and, you know, as I say, I mean, I was part of a government in the past in Australia, which decided to, to join and to support it. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, <laughs> there is there is somewhat of a proliferation of uh, development banks at um, of different sizes. And, you know, in the end, um, you know, it's, it's good that there is a lot of um, effort and a lot of goodwill, but I mean, I guess the point that I was trying to make is that to the extent that we have a proliferation of uh, banks, of multilateral development banks of all sizes, um, it, it is important that we have a level of coordination uh, and that we ensure a level of coherence uh, as we uh, work uh, collectively uh, to achieve the um, sustainable development objectives uh, under the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We are, Eight years away from, and, and you know, in recent years, including uh, because of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, we, we've been going backwards. Um, so th there really is um, uh, an important need for renewed effort and focus. And, and I guess the point I'm making is that um, there are always going to be limited resources, and, and to the extent that there are, um, 
you know, more and more players uh, deploying a, a limited set of resources, we really need to do everything we can to optimize their impact. Uh, and, and that is where global cooperation and, and coordination comes in. You also mentioned that the world is currently falling short of the um, investment needs that are out there. Um, if you look in particular at the region of operation of the AIB, if you look at Asia, where do you think, where do you see the most pressing problems? Uh, well, look, I mean, you know, across, you know, the, the lowest income countries, the least developed countries in particular have got very, very severe uh, needs. And, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the sort of necessary infrastructure development to give them the best possible opportunity to succeed in a, in a global marketplace. Um, I mean, I think you're probably, I mean, the IIIB is a best place to identify the, the specific uh, priority areas of focus for, for its uh, operation. But I mean, I think that if you look across the world, including across Asia, and you look at uh, you know, some of the uh, desperate and urgent needs of the least developed um, economies around the world, I mean, there, there is a lot that can and a lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, my last question to you is really about the OECD. And I think you mentioned yourself the important role that the OECD plays as a coordinator of development activity and also as a standard setter. Yet the OECD as an institution does not include the BRICS countries and other emerging economies. Do you think that brings a legitimacy problem? Well, I mean, you know, clearly, I mean, the OECD was set up as a as a um, organization bringing together uh, like-minded market-based democracies uh, who share a commitment uh, to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, uh, market-based economic principles, but but also a rules-based. Uh, international uh, order. But, um, you know, when it comes to policy issues, when it comes to global cooperation, when it uh, comes to facilitating uh, the best possible solution to our shared challenges, I think the OECD has also demonstrated uh, a, a, a very important pragmatism and a capacity to work inclusively with uh, countries all around the world. I mean, that is what we did in relation uh, to tax uh, through the Development Center. We do that in the context of development. Um, and, uh, you know, that is what we're also seeking to do when it comes to climate through our recent initiative for an inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approaches, which where we want to bring advanced uh, emerging and developing economies together to share uh, information and data about their efforts uh, to reduce emissions, but also, uh, I guess, uh, uh, pursue the conversation on how we can better coordinate uh, policy actions in individual jurisdictions to optimize the impact at a global level. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank you for also asking questions about your own uh, institution. I think that was really very well, very interesting. Thank you for being with us. Um, we will now move to the second part of this webinar, um, which is a panel uh, with stakeholders from the many different groups involved in the AIIB. Let me now introduce to you the panelists. Um, we have with us Professor Nairi Woods. Nairi is a member of the AIIB's International Advisory Panel. She's a foremost expert on international financial institutions and serves as inaugural dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and professor of global economic governance at the University of Oxford. We have with us Ms. Kwantang Ha. Ha is Deputy Director General of the Department for International Cooperation of the State Bank of Vietnam. And she was, until this summer, Director of a constituency of shareholders in the AIIB, so knows the institution really well. We also have with us Francesca Utili. Francesca is Head of International Financial Relations in the Ministry of Econom Economy and Finance of Italy in Rome. Francesca is involved in a number of international financial institutions, always representing Italy. And last but not least, we have Ludger Schutknecht. Ludger is Vice President and Corporate Secretary at the AIIB. He also acted as the Chief Negotiator for Germany in the founding of the AIIB, making him one of the architects and one of the drafters of its Articles of Agreement. Now, Welcome to you all. Um, we will first have a round of opening questions and then discuss some challenges facing the AIIB. But um, let me start with an opening question to Nairi. Nairi, the AIIB is still a fairly young institution. What scorecard would you give it if you were, you know, thinking, think about it as a, as a child of six years old, just starting out in school, but already time for the first report. Has it achieved what it set out to do? 
Uh, thank you, Frederica. Um, I'm going to give the AIIB eight out of 10. Um, let's go back to 2016 and think about the doubts that people had about this institution. Would it, would it get members? Yes. It's now got 105 members. So that shows it's got buy-in from around the world. So that's, that's a, a high mark right there. Second, people worried that it would degrade development standards and de development lending standards. Um, actually, the ambition of the president to have a lean, clean, green bank has been pretty much borne out. It's very aligned uh, with World Bank standards, thanks to the diligence and hard work of the staff. I note that in 2021, 88% of its lending was um, aligned with its green infrastructure ambition. So that's pretty good. Um, I think a third thing was, you know, would it function well as a multilateral? And multilateral banks, if we're honest, have problems. They have boards which try to micromanage every loan. They have a problem of accountability because who is it that's really making the lending decision? Is it all countries trading off with each other or is it the ineffective technocratic management? The AIIB has tried something bold on that. It's got it's delegating some decisions to the management. It's overseeing the uh, president and the quality of, of management, and it's doing pretty well. It's dispersed some, what is it, um, to, to 33 countries, 190 projects, some $36 billion worth of lending. So that's pretty good. And it's been very adaptable. It's um, responded to COVID with a new facility, which has dispersed a lot of money um, since COVID. That said, I think, I think so far no AIIB loans have reached more than 20% of their disbursement. So now there is there are some challenges, not unlike those of other multilateral development banks, of actually getting the money out the door, getting the projects actually to completion um, and, you know, and, and ensuring they, they work. But, but overall, it's a pretty good start um, through very difficult terrain both geopolitical pressures, COVID, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of headwinds that this young bank has met over its first six years. It's doing pretty well. Thank you so much, Nairi. Um, if my children brought home eight out of 10 every time, I would be very pleased. Um, Ludger, as one of the, I mean, this is a bit of a wrong analogy, but, you know, as someone who was involved in the setting up of the bank, um, as a parent, if I may, so what is the view from inside the bank now? Do you think the governance model is working? Thank you, Frederica, and thank you also, Nairi. Uh, many of the points you've made, I, uh, I think, speak very much from my heart as well. We are indeed a young institution, and uh, we have learned a lot, but there is still also a lot to learn for us. Uh, and uh, uh, the large number of countries, the good project development, the fact that we are well accepted in the uh, in the MDB family, we are well respected member. I think is is a good thing. And you know, I joined the bank one and a half years ago. Uh, I was responsible also for supervising the bank when I was still in the Ministry of Finance. And if I would not have joined if I had didn't have faith uh, in the bank. And what I saw when I came here is in line with that, you know, a young institution with challenges going forward, but I think uh, with a with a good record so far. And I mean, our AAA rating reflects not only sound finances, it also reflects, as you may know, the rating agencies, they also look at the governance of the bank. And that governance is judged by outsiders to be to be a strong, uh, strong one. Uh, and so I think that both inside and with our shareholders and our clients, we are on a good path. Um, maybe if if I brief can briefly comment on a few features of our governance that that I think uh, our audience might interest. Um, uh, Nairi mentioned um, the fact that uh, you know we have a clearer separation of responsibility than some of our peers to lear learning from them actually by uh, you know having the board focus on strategic and policy issues while the bank deals with the management of the bank and on top you know we have a non-resident board uh, that means the the shareholders are not permanently seated inside the bank and that makes it also easier to pursue such an approach and it saves a lot of money uh, to be honest and um, we are also committed to sustainable banking. That means that our projects 
unless there is concessional finance involved, but as a, on the regular basis, they, they have to earn their return. So they have to be quality, high quality projects. And we have promised to our shareholders not to go back to them every couple of years with demands for more money. So this uh, principles laid down in our articles of agreement of a sustainable bank that is, uh, um, that also doesn't always ask for new money makes us, I think, uh, uh, more conducive to be to be lean. Uh, and the last last point that is relevant also for the twenty first century very much. I mean, our shareholder structure, our shareholder structure is uh, roughly twenty five percent of the votes for advanced countries about a quarter for China and the rest for a mostly Asian advanced and emerging economies. So in that sense, it's different from at least the other big MDBs. And here in this environment, we have most of our very important decisions are uh, supermajority decisions, which require 75% majority of the votes. So no group can dominate in our bank, which makes First of all, the high standards of our articles of agreement are to change, but it also means that we all have to work together to forge consensus, to agree and work towards the high reputation of the bank, and nobody can really work against that. So I think it makes us a good, good base, a good model for a 21st century bank that also takes into account of the reality that you know the the economic weights on the in the world have somewhat shifted over recent decades thank you Ludger. um that is very interesting indeed the view from inside now we are shifting to the outside again and my next question is to ha so what is the view from an emerging country such as vietnam you're you're both a client and a shareholder is the aib delivering for vietnam ha Thank you very much for the for the question. It's actually very interesting that I will ask uh, that question because that uh, exactly what we have to ponder upon uh, at least every every year when we prepare the reports on our participation in international organization in general and MDBs in, in particular. I will split my answer in, into two parts. Uh, as uh, shareholders, uh, we, we see, we acknowledge, and as a founding member, we feel proud that AIB has made important achievement in expanding both its membership and the activity. And I think that uh, Nairi has already mentioned uh, some of that. Uh, after only six years in operation, AIB has nearly doubled its members its members from 57 to more than 100. And by the end of third quarter of this year, uh, the approved portfolio of the bank reached 190 projects worth more than 36 billion US dollars for borrowers from 33 countries. Uh, bank, banks' products and activities has been expanded, covering all sectors within the infrastructure spectrum. Uh, furthermore, besides providing financing to its member developments uh, of infrastructure projects, AAB has been swift uh, and efficient in making adjustments internally in responding to the changing environment, which is important to ensure the bank's resilience and sustainability, both operationally and financially, uh, financially and, and the bank's uh, contribution to the joint efforts of the MDBs in supporting members in this uh, very difficult environment. We also acknowledge that AIB pay attention to develop and facilitate its uh, learning culture. We consider this culture very important for a young institution that uh, wants to be innovative like AIB and strongly encourage AIB to continue its efforts in, in this regard. Um, uh, if there is something that we would expect AIB to do more as a shareholder, and I think I have mentioned this to the management when I was a member of the board of directors, is that uh, while trying to support countries in Emerging needs, AIB should ensure that its activities are focused on the core mandate, which is to support members' development of infrastructure projects. Uh, we are a lean and a small bank. We would do better if we are more focused. Um, secondly, as a client, AIB has been swift in meeting the changing and urgent demands of the member countries. Uh, when COVID-19 uh, outbroke, AIB was among the first to uh, offer the, the CIF, the Crisis Response Facility, for members uh, being affected by the by the pandemic. Uh, the facility has 
has been uh, reviewed and revised uh, regularly and timely as demand change. Um, that for us uh, show the agility of AIB in terms of cooperation and, res and its responsible uh, responsibility uh, to the to the member. Uh, at the same time, while we acknowledge that the project procedure in general is efficient, and the bank staff work very hard with borrowers to develop and implement the projects, I think that the needs and specific circumstances of the member countries should be taken into consideration better. In more particular, AIB should consider to offer um, more accommodative uh, borrowing costs for lower income uh, member countries. Um, in this regard, we highly acknowledge the establishment of the special fund window, but uh, more needs to be done. Uh, technical assistance to help members uh, meet the project requirement, especially the ENS, the, inter uh, the environmental and social uh, standards of the bank, uh, need to be provided. And uh, relevant support to, to member countries' gradual and sustained transition to the green energy or Paris alignment is also very important. As uh, both a uh, role a shareholder and a client, um, I generally see that uh, to see the valuable assets of the bank, that is the strong, strongly committed management and the highly qualified and diligent staff. We believe that uh, with those factors, uh, the bank will continue to deliver what is expected to achieve by, by us as a shareholder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ha. Thank you for these opening remarks uh, from Vietnam. And my last opening question is to Francesca from Italy. You're representing a G7 country. From your point of view, is the capital invested in the Italian shareholding in the AIIB put to good use? Thanks for your question. And let me begin by thanking the AIB for this opportunity to discuss such a relevant topic. Um, to start with, uh, I can say that the bank works for Italy as it maintains a constant dialogue with shareholders to assure quality and timely discussions on strategic issues, and it is open to continuous enhancements of its organizational setting. You know that Italy has supported the institution since its inception and looks forward to continuous engagement. And uh, indeed, uh, looking at current positive developments in terms of growth, we believe that the AAB can further explore its potential, building on a significant experience and value added, which is brought by those member countries like Italy and the EU countries that have been important players in shaping the current multilateral system, particularly in terms of operational, environmental and social standards. Those standards um, must remain uh, stepping stones of the, of, the activity, um, of the activity on which a successful development institution builds its presence and, uh, and its relevance. Um, in relation to the capital invested, uh, it will be important that the AIB is able to keep calibrating on its own governance structure, its risk assessment and management capability, and its ability to develop and exploit its excellent human capital potential to which we are pleased to contribute. At the same time, the bank should maintain a high pro-development profile in the project it supports and a cautious approach towards investments with a purely financial nature, where the degree of effective control of the use of its funds is delegated to complex financial management structures. Uh, I believe that it's now important that the bank maintains its well-shaped investment portfolio and its well-established positioning on the international financial markets as recognized by the prestigious AAA standalone rating. We expect the bank to continue minimizing the cost of carrying additional liquidity and having a very attentive asset and liability management to maintain its high rating, especially in this moment of global turbulences. Finally, let me mention that the Italian industry and the service sector look with ever increasing interest at expanding their presence in Asia. The Italian economy is capable of supplying innovative solutions and is leader in several sectors which strongly relate with the broad infrastructure development that can help AIB to contribute to a sustainable, balanced, and inclusive, long-lasting growth of the region. 
Thank you, Francesca. Thank you so much. That concludes the first round of questions. Um, we've agreed that we would now look at specific challenges facing the AIIB, and uh, I will ask you uh, questions accordingly. The first question is for first Ha and then Ludka, if I can ask you for, for shortish answers about COVID and the importance of building trust um, when a new institution is set up and face-to-face -face interactions are obviously very important for building that trust. Um, unfortunately, the early years, so to speak, the kindergarten years of the AIB fell together with COVID. How much has the pandemic held back the trust building, the institutional maturity, the maturing process in the AIB? First Ha and then Lodga. Thank you. Uh, it is of no question that COVID-19 has uh, negative impacts on communication and integration of the, of the bank, not to mention the bank operation, especially project uh, development, implementation and, and monitoring. Actually, it's not quite easy for me to access how much the pandemic has held back AIB in a broader sense. Let me narrow down my, my answer to the relation and interaction of the border directors uh, to be more relevant. Uh, if I can, if I can calculate the impact of AIB um, on AIB may be as much as uh, what other peer institutions have experienced as COVID-19 spared no one from its damage, uh, plus the fact that the bank is headquartered in Beijing, which is now still subject to travel restriction, but minus the element that AIB has a non-resident board uh, where our day-to-day face-to-face interaction is in nature partly virtual already. Uh, we have more online board meetings, more policy change and more investment proposals to be considered and approved. Uh, the board, as for management and staff, had to work uh, around the clock. And for us, the board, it is sometimes literally means 24-7, uh, given the fact that being the board member is a part-time job for, for all of us. Virtual meetings may have also discouraged us, uh, discouraged us from sharing more than what we have planned to intervene before the meetings. No formal chat at coffee breaks. Actually, there was no coffee break, no lunch on or dinner together. Even our fireside chat with the president uh, were held virtually. So for sure, there, there was minus effect to the communication among board members and between the board and the management. Uh, but at least for me, I don't think there was some ruining e effect on the trust building. The bank has been very agile and efficient in adoption of technology to facilitate meetings and later on project monitorings. Uh, more frequent, even urgent meetings and calls between the board members and management have been arranged at either side's request. Uh, I think that not it's, it is not via what means we communicate, it is how we communicate and how timely the provision of information and open uh, the uh, open the exchange of view is the, that decides uh, the level of trust. Uh, we made uh, quite a number of Im important decisions to the bank's operation during that time. And of course, virtually tens of things section was uh, held for those decisions. I think the pandemic has required us to be more confident in our ourselves in delegating and trusting the management and staff. Uh, if there was evidence that the health back effect was not um, serious, I, I would use the comprehensive review of the accountability framework taking place in April this year as an example. Uh, while we discussed deeply and e extensively uh, about the review and we did disagree on some assessment, uh, we agreed to continue the level of delegation uh, we intended to give the management at the beginning when the framework was formed. That is a form of trust. Um, from a form of trust uh, between the board and the management. Uh, having said that, I still look forward to having face-to-face -face interaction with the bank, uh, its management, its staff, uh, our fellow constituency members and board members, uh, even when the trust is, is already been there. Thank you. Lord Gern. Thank you, Frederica, and thank you, Ha. I think uh, I can follow up on this very uh, easily. The, indeed, I mean, it is clear that the uh, pandemic has not made life easier for us. I mean, you, you can only go so far in monitoring projects through the use of consultants or drones or uh, uh, other uh, substitutes. But now we have established a hub in the UAE from which uh, we will be able to compensate for some of these shortcomings and make travel, client relations, project monitoring, et cetera, easier. 
But let me just mention two two uh, uh, examples how here also in such a challenge, uh, challenging uh, uh, situation with COVID, our governance I think has proven itself. The first one is we were very quick and agile to react to COVID um, with the establishment of our uh, crisis support facility. And, you know, our bank is the only one which where the board actually evaluates the president. And I, without reaching confidentiality rules, I can say so much that the, the board, our directors, our shareholders have appreciated this uh, quick reaction and uh, by the president, by the management. And through this evaluation, we know about this. We have a dialogue about it. And that's a good thing. So the crisis forced us, uh, required us to react quickly. And this happened then in a good dialogue uh, with the board. And Ha mentioned uh, our review, the review of our governance that in a way is an ongoing process and we have we have institutional uh, institutionalized elements, but we are now actually engaged in a dialogue very much under the guidance of our directors to further develop our governance. So I would say this trust-based model that we have where, you know, management is trusted with management and board is uh, doing the strategy and policy is showing exactly that, that it is working this modern governance structure. But uh, let me also say uh, uh, that I agree with Ha that, you know, we are planning to move back to physical meetings uh, as of March, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, let me take the opportunity to remind the audience that there is the possibility to submit questions. You just click on the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, we have some questions coming in, but uh, please feel free to submit more. In the meanwhile, I'd like to turn to Nairi and uh, uh, mention another challenge, not just for the AIB, but for all MDBs really, that's stakeholder plurality. I mean, the AIB, like others, has to balance the interests of a large number of stakeholder groups. I mean, you know, there are shareholders, there are client countries, private sector, other international financial institutions. From your point of view, that is a bit sort of drilling down into the report you've given the bank so far, where is it working well and where is there work to do? Uh, thank you, Frederica. Look, I'd stand back first and say Matthias Kormann, you know, questioned whether a proliferation of multilateral development banks is a, is a good thing or whether we should be cautious about that. Are we cluttering the landscape of development financing? And on that, my answer is it is a good thing to have another multilateral development bank. I think in a world which is fragmenting quickly, we need more institutions in which a large number of countries come together to speak and to cooperate. Um, particularly in, in the face of global challenges like climate and, and the pandemic. And I think that the, the, the AIIB works not as a stumbling block, but as a, as a real building block to better cooperation. It creates, these institutions create in each of their member states a habit of cooperation, a habit of speaking to each other, and we need more of that in the world and not less. It also means that there is competition among multilaterals, and that might not be welcome in some corners. I personally believe that competition is what keeps human enterprises nimble and agile and at their best game. So that competition, I think, is good. And it gives some choice to borrowers, which I think is also important, that for a borrowing country, as Ha spoke about from the perspective of Vietnam, it's good to be able to choose which, which organization. Now, Ha mentioned that... Um, you know, she'd like to see, you know, as a, as a borrower, it would be good to see more technical assistance from the bank, for example, on meeting its environmental standards. So just, just picking up on that, I think to your question, Frederica, that one of the things that the AIB could do to improve relations with stakeholders, or one of the reasons why stakeholders is important, is because an absolute golden rule of development financing is that projects will work best when they are owned by the communities in which they're being built. That's to say they're understood as a priority and they're felt to be a priority within the community and it's got the community's support and engagement. And I think there, the reason why the AIIB will want to keep working on developing really good frameworks for engaging local communities, local stakeholders, you know, local private sector organizations, is because that's going to give the, the projects that it's um, funding the best chance of success. And, you know, many governments are still in, you know, um, 
uh, early stages of learning how best to communicate with different parts of a community, often parts of communities which disagree with one another. And there, I think, a multilateral development bank can come in with a cool head and with an experience of all different multilaterals on how to do this best and provide a really useful framework. So, so I think the AIB is doing very well with its different government stakeholders. It'll do even better when it can bring them together in person and build trust. Um, it's beginning to work and, and develop relationships with the private sector. It needs to do more of that. The bank's aware of that. It's working hard on it. And it can now begin to think about what's the framework for local community relations. Thank you, Nairi. Thank you so much. Um, the next challenge that I'd like to throw into the frame is uh, learning from peers. I mean, we heard how the AIB has a very distinct and, and in many ways innovative setup as a fairly young institution. But um, Francesca, this is a question for you as someone who also engages with other MDBs and other IFIs. What do you think the AIIB can learn from older institutions? Uh, thanks, Frederick. And uh, yeah, being innovative as the bank is, is not only about new products, but it is also about having the ability to act as a facilitator for enhanced collaboration among regional and bilateral financial institutions. So in all fora, um, Italy has been advocating the idea that MDBs should not be seen as individual institutions competing for scarce resources, but instead as a system which would be able to deliver a transformative impact where each institution can build on its competitive advantage. AIB in particular has moved fast to establish itself as an important emerging actor in the MDB's family, strengthening ties with the multilateral community through active coordination and as a key catalyzer of economic development in the region. Uh, Cross-border uh, infrastructure projects and networks involve several countries and face specific challenges as they are by nature more complex and for which high coordination among MDBs is crucial. In all contexts, AIB has well integrated the international financial architecture while maintaining its innovative business approach to infrastructure financing and the culture of lean, green, clean, which could be inspirational for other MDBs. So so what I would say is the bank should continue seeking an open and effective collaboration with other multilateral and bilateral developing institutions and further contribute to strengthen the existing infrastructure financial landscape, spurring innovation in the development of infrastructure as an asset class. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are already advancing in time and we will soon have time for the audience questions. But as a sort of quick fire round, um, kind of closing the official part of the panel, I would like to ask each of you now in turn to give me a very short answer. Three sentences max. I'll keep counting. Um, and maybe we start with Ha. Um, how would you improve the AIB going forward? And once Ha has had her turn, maybe we can move seamlessly round the clock, so to speak, and then go to Francesca, Nairi, and, and Ludger Lars. But Ha, so to you first, how would you improve the AIB going forward in three sentences? Uh, yes, uh, I, I have three sentences uh, for that. First, uh, stay focused on the infrastructure and on the reason. Uh, second, be diversified in all sense and aspect could be uh, staff, projects, gender, professional, background, geographies. And lastly, the third one, AIB is still very young. As shareholder, we should be patient and supportive to make sure the bank going the direction we envisage. We also need to be consistent as uh, parents. Thank you. Francesca? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I would focus on continue working on becoming a leading employer among multilateral institutions, attracting best talents. Uh, second, maintain high quality of investment as the portfolio grows. And third, um, even more efficiency in procedures and transparency for project finance loans. Thank you, Nairi. So the bank's there to serve some of the neediest people in the world and to forge cooperation. 
So it needs first get the funding out the door and get projects completed so that they serve those people. And second, really bring the countries of the world together in its board, in its staff, in its meetings, be a real forum for trust building among countries and cooperation. Thank you, Ludger. Thanks, thanks, Ulrike. And for all this to be achieved, I would say well, we need to focus on three things. I mean, the first one is young institution needs to focus on internal capacity building. We, we still have a lot of work to do there. The second is, of course, you know, if we want to deliver on our mandate with high standards, we also need to work with our clients and our stakeholders to stay competitive and to stay in line with our mandate. And the final thing is, uh, that's the session of that's the theme of this session. I mean, is to to keep the integrity of our governance. It's ultimately the governance. It's governance in our countries, in companies, and in MDBs that determines the quality of the outcome and the future, you know, uh, uh, delivery on the objectives. So I think uh, on that one, we also need to stay on course, but I'm quite confident that we will. Thank you so much. I like the brevity. I think there was a lot to take notes on and I think, uh, hope everyone listening in was taking notes and these uh, good wishes for the AIB and sort of learning objectives were uh, taken on board. Now, I have some questions from the audience, actually, and um, there are a couple relating to climate change, and I will address them together. And I was wondering who in the panel would like to uh, reply to that. I think maybe Ludger's uh, corporate secretary's best place here. Um, is the AIB doing enough to support global efforts on climate change? And is it doing enough to help developing countries adapt to climate change? Um, from your point of view, Ludger, what are you seeing? Yeah, thanks. I think this is in terms of what we do as institutions, of course, the key question as regards, you know, contributing to global public goods, uh, ma mastering the impending climate crisis, that, that's the key. Now, we have uh, already in our articles of agreement with our value of green, I think we, we are predetermined to take this very, we were predetermined to take this very seriously already when the discussion started. Now in our corporate strategy, we are committing, we have committed ourselves to do 50% of our financing by 2025 to deal with the climate challenges. And last year we already reached 48. So I think we will get well beyond that. And that objective is very much in line with our peers. And uh, we have uh, various instruments, including Paris alignment that Matthias mentioned at the beginning, uh, um, uh, and our, our, on the financing side as well to to actually do this. Now, um, the question also referred to not just to mitigation that is reducing carbon emissions and thereby uh, enhancing the chances of getting uh, to uh, uh, getting to net zero, but also adaptation. How we make our economies more resilient towards the challenges, uh, and here the poorest countries are often the most at risk and most at threat. Uh, and here, the, the share of financing that goes to adaptation clearly has to increase. But also that we have recognized we are in the in our corporate strategy implementation framework, you know, bureaucracies, organizations always have to have acronyms and uh, nice words. Uh, we are planning to also increase the share of adaptation related finance. And we are working on uh, buying in, on uh, drawing in, uh, contributors and cooperation partners, not only in the MDW world, but also in the private sector. Uh, we are part of the most important global networks for supporting uh, the financing of climate change. So I think uh, institutionally, uh, we are on a good course to be to support this objective as part of the MDB family. Thank you, Ludger. Um, another question that has come in is about expanding the lending or the region of operation of the AIIB. Um, so the question I read it is, what is the plan to invest out of Asia and why? You're already lending to some Eastern European countries. Uh, what is the, the ultimate plan there? Um, and to save Ludger from answering everything, maybe I'll address this question to Francesca as a shareholder, um, important shareholder from Europe. Where do you see the AIB investing in the future sort of out of Asia? Is that a direction you would be welcoming? 
Well, I think that we should put this question in the context of what I was saying on uh, MDBs working as a system and uh, having a specific competitive um, advantage which, which should need to be, uh, to be fully exploited. And the specific characteristic of the bank of uh, being a lean, clean and green and its, its specific structure, its um, agility and flexibility um, could be uh, of interest also if they are uh, put in place in, uh, in other areas. So I think that um, in general, one should really try to keep um, a very, uh, very uh, strong um, uh, connection and try to exploit in the best way possible all the possible uh, synergies that, um, that several institutions uh, can, um, can have when they work together. So uh, even if uh, it has not uh, been at the center of our attention now, I think that one cannot exclude that, that those type of uh, dynamics could also uh, happen in the future. So uh, that, that would be uh, an area of, of interest. Can I come in briefly, Frederico? Of course, the, uh, of course, Lucia, yeah, please. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, I think Francesca is very right. I mean, one has to look at the uh, multilateral framework here and the cooperation on the comparative advantages. And um, I mean, for us, we do have a almost global membership, but we still have said we focus on Asia. Only up to 15% of our financing is non-regional, but for our global membership, for global public goods, and for connectivity to Asia, it does make sense that we also finance outside Asia. And we usually or mostly do this also in co-financing. So we do it, as Francesca says, in collaboration with the broader MDB community and, and also national financial institutions. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. It's a fairly specific question addressed to Ludger. So um, this is for you again. Could Ludger please comment on progress aligning the AIIB with the World Bank and the ADB in terms of the environmental and social framework? Um, yeah, how, how aligned are you um, and are there any challenges? I would say this is this is actually another innovation of our bank that I have not commented on, but that that is is innovative and maybe is something that others could copy as well. Uh, and that is how do we treat each other's social and environmental and governance standards? These standards are really essential for delivering high quality uh, uh, infrastructure for and for helping with institution building in our members. And I must say that we are very much aligned with the main MDB players, with all high standard players, also national institutions like the CASA in Italy or KFW in Germany. And in, we can even, and we do in our co-finance projects, accept and basically adopt the environmental, social and governance standards of our partner institutions to save money, to save time, to save our clients undue multiple due diligence, as it is called, you know, so excessive bureaucracy, basically, in project finance. And so I think, uh, and we could also move towards more agreements in this regards. We are currently discussing with KFW whether we can have mutual recognition. But I think this shows very much that uh, uh, we are we are taking this very seriously. I think this is an important question from the stakeholder community and from the client community where we are in constant communication. But I would also say that here, uh, uh, our our approach is is in line and uh, with with the with the highest standards uh, of our of our community. Great. Okay. I think we are now out of time for another audience question. I'm really sorry for for those whose questions haven't been picked up. Um, there are a couple more, but we are already moving into the last minute. So. Um, this only really leaves me time to conclude our cinema, seminar, Building Modern Governance for Effective Multilateralism. I'd like to thank our speakers and panelists for their contributions and you in the audience for your attention and also for the questions. I very much hope you found the last hour as entertaining and as enriching as I did. And I very much wish the AIIB all the best for the future. It's only really starting out in its school career, so to speak. Very promising start. Um, all the best for the future. Thank you all for joining and have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.